thank you all for being here and braving the rain and nasty weather out there. I'm so excited to be with you guys today. We are new to Green Acres. We moved here from Louisiana last year and um, visited churches for seemed like a lot of months. You got a lot of churches to work through. Um, I thought we had churches back home, but y'all y'all are in a special category here in East Texas. Um, But we're loving Green Acres. It has truly been an answer to prayer for us. And um, we're just really happy here. And I'm looking forward to getting more involved and getting to know all of you ladies as time goes on. When Debbie asked me to speak today, I honestly wasn't sure how I felt about it because we're still so new and I didn't want to do it just out of obligation or, you know, because she asked me to. So I started praying that if the Lord would have me speak today, that he would lay something specific on my heart. And after several days of prayer, he gave me clarity on something that I could talk about. And so that's what I'm going to share today. It's some of my story. It's some of of what the Lord has taught me these past few years. Um, Y'all know that I am not an expert on anything in my spiritual walk or anything I'm going to talk about today or public speaking for that matter. But um, I'm just a Christian who is just going to share what the Lord is teaching me and uh, the things that I still preach to myself every day. So I pray that y'all will connect with my words and that you'll find something I say encouraging. Um, A little background on who I am. My husband, Luke, and I grew up in the same little church in Louisiana. Uh, We started dating in college. We got married young. Um, He's a financial advisor. I'm an RN, but I've spent the last couple years as a stay-at-home mom, and uh, that's been really awesome. I've really enjoyed being able to focus more on my family. Um, After we had been married several years, we decided to try to have kids and um, got pregnant easily, had an easy pregnancy, somewhat easy. I don't know that we can ever really say pregnancy is easy, but there were no complications. Um, Had our daughter in 2011, and she was just the best baby. She was so sweet. She loved to sleep. So, like, that's a great baby in my book. But um, it was just easy. Life was good. We had a pretty easy transition to parenthood and um, just really enjoyed that time in our lives. Um, a few years later, I guess two years later, we decided to try to have a second child and we realized that that whole process was just not gonna go as smoothly the second time around. We experienced heartbreak and trials in trying to have another baby. Um, It was just a really hard time in our lives. I had been a Christian for around 20 years at that time. And I didn't realize it, but it was like all of those years, my faith was in a little box. You know, I was just kind of going through the motions. I was going to church. I um, <clears throat> had my Christian friends around me. I did Bible study, but there were clearly things that I was holding back from the Lord all of that time. And so the Lord used that year, year and a half in my life to strip away all of those things that I had always depended on. And I truly had to depend on the Lord every single day. That was a time when I didn't have a lot of joy in my personal circumstances, but I was experiencing this new joy in the Lord that I had never experienced before. And it was just so exciting every day. I can truly tell y'all that I have not been the same since that time. And um, I had a fire in my soul at the end of that year that I had never had before, specifically for evangelism and discipleship. God was so gracious to bless us with our son, Anderson, uh, toward the end of 2014. And he is just, he was such a good baby in a different way. <laughs> so sweet, um, a lot of energy, and it, it was just funny going through that with a girl and then a boy, and it's like everything is so different, but still so fun, and we're just so thankful that the Lord chose to, to give us a second child. Um, a few months after I had him, I was kind of finally emerging from that postpartum fog us moms all seem to experience. And I started praying about what the Lord would have me do with that newfound desire I had to share his love. And one idea kept coming up in my mind over and over again, start a porch Bible study. I was like, this is so weird. Like a porch Bible study, I just thought it was the strangest idea 
Um, I thought, uh, no one have I ever met has done something like that, and I don't want to be the first. Um, We live in Louisiana, super humid. We don't like hanging out on the porch in Louisiana. My sweet darling boy cried quite a bit of his first year of life. I thought, how can I be hosting a study on the porch with an infant crying on the other side of the door all evening? I just, you know, kept sharing all of these reservations with the Lord. The biggest one being that I didn't even know my neighbors. Like, how weird am I going to be showing up, knocking on their door, being like, I have a Bible study on the porch. You want to come? I just shared over and over, Lord, I, I just really don't think I can do this. And that prompting would not go away. It only got stronger. And it was so specific. Start a porch Bible study. Eventually, I got to the point where I felt like I was sinning to not follow through with this. And so I just told the Lord, you know what? I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna trust you with what this looks like and what comes of it. Um, And so I did. I invited a few friends that lived near me. I invited a couple of neighbors. We had a neighbor named Mike across the street and I knew he had a girlfriend. Uh, I'd never met her. I just saw her outside and we would you know, wave from across the street from time to time. And I I can't remember if I walked across the street to tell him or if I just texted him. But I do remember that I didn't even know his girlfriend's name and I fretted all afternoon that they were gonna think I was a nut job. Finally, late that afternoon, he texted back and said, her name is Rosanna and she's coming. I was like, go God, yay. I can't wait to see what's gonna happen. I mean, it was just so exciting to me. That study was a really sweet time. We met uh, probably four to five women per week um, just on the porch. We just talked about God's word. It was pretty informal. Uh, One of the girls who came was going into full-time mission work in Guatemala shortly after this. So that was really cool to get to pray with her and kind of be a part of some of the prep that she was still working through and trying to, you know, change her entire life and go to the mission field. Sometimes someone would bring chocolate chip cookies homemade, which is really exciting for me. We also got to hear my son screaming from inside the house every time. That was definitely a thing. They thought it was hilarious. I found it less than delightful, but the Lord really was gracious to keep that from being the distraction I really had feared it would be. But one thing that I was kind of discouraged about was that Rosanna only came once or maybe twice. I wondered if she you know, just flat out didn't like it or, you know, was offended by something or I I really didn't know what to think. Um, We didn't stay in touch too closely after that. We uh, would text every now and then just kind of to stay updated on what was going on in each other's lives. And of course, you know, we always waved and chatted when we saw each other outside, but there really wasn't a ton of interaction after that. A few years passed, my husband and I had moved to a different neighborhood and um, I only saw Rosanna probably once or twice a year after that, you know, just kind of around town, really kind of lost touch. Five years after that study, I got a text from Rosanna asking me if I had any recommendations for a lawn service. Um, Mike had always had just a perfect, beautiful yard that he did himself. And so I texted her back and said, I can't believe Mike's going to let someone else touch his yard. She texted back and said that Mike had died of COVID a couple of weeks before. It was shocking. Mike was fairly young. He was healthy. This was very early on in the pandemic, and I didn't even know anyone yet who had gotten the virus. It was really hard to wrap my mind around Mike's sudden passing. And Rosanna was just heartbroken. A few days later, I sat on, sat on Rosanna's porch and she told me the whole story of his sudden illness and his passing. I was really thankful that she felt safe enough with me that she could share those stories. And those vulnerable conversations really drew our hearts together in a way that made our friendship feel old, even though we were really just getting to know each other. I found it remarkable that of all the people in her life, she had reached out to me when she was in need. And I didn't see that as a coincidence at all. I saw it as a divine opportunity. 
I made sure that Rosanna and I didn't fall out of touch after that. We um, went to the nursery and picked out our flowers together. We took walks together. Um, we, pl- we talked in the backyard while my kids played as we're kind of in the throes of this pandemic. Uh, we sat on my front porch and chatted. Porches definitely had a theme in our relationship. But we just did life together, and I tried to use every opportunity possible to point her to Christ. Eventually, she shared with me that she really wanted more of the godly community that we had. She was lonely, and she just wanted more people in her life that she could share her life with. And I know so many of us feel that same way. I was very involved with Bible study fellowship at the time, so I invited her to come with me, and and she loved BSF. She really thrived in that environment. She loved meeting new women. She loved that it got her out of the house. It gave her something to look forward to every week that she could do in the evenings. Um, She loved studying God's Word. That was kind of a new thing, really digging in for her. So over the course of many months, I started seeing how the Lord was using these trials in Rosanna's life in huge ways. She started coming to church with me. She was at BSF every week. She was so excited about studying and kind of like Debbie and I were, Debbie was talking about how we were talking about, um, you know, just discussing these things. Rosanna and I would do that too. And she was just so excited about the Lord. She's doing amazing. I love her so much. She's finishing up her third BSF study, and I am just so thankful for her. Our bond is so strong because we did life together in the trenches, and we found that our hope is in the same God. So um, God really orchestrated a very significant friendship through that weird little nudge that I couldn't seem to shake, and I'm so thankful for that. The reason I wanted to share that story with y'all today is because the Lord used that in my life to hammer home to me the importance of discipleship, the importance of walking alongside our sisters in uplifting community and sharing the hope that we have in Christ. Up until that point, I had allowed so many excuses to hold me back from evangelism, missions, and discipleship. And it's because deep down, I thought it all depended on me. Someone else always knew more than I did, so they were way more qualified, right? Um, I wondered, you know, what, what would happen if I got into a situation where I realized, oh my goodness, I just don't even know enough to be in this conversation? What if they ask me something about the Lord or the Bible that turns them away? Or just what if it's awkward? And maybe those are questions that you have had as well. And if so, I wanna share with you some things the Lord has taught me these past few years that have really helped to free me from a lot of those fears that I carried with me for so long. And I don't have it all figured out. I'm still learning every day, but the Lord has truly given me a changed perspective that I know didn't come from myself. I'd like to share a few scriptures with you guys. Um, The first one is 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 7. And y'all feel free to turn or don't. I'll read them all, so it's up to you. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. I don't know how that scripture strikes you, but to me, it is so liberating. It's so liberating to remember that I am nothing. I am only a servant of the Lord. I can accomplish nothing on my own and only God can cause growth. This passage removes the pressure from me. It reminds me that I can't produce fruit in whoever I share God's love with because I don't have that power. Only the Holy Spirit can bring about transformative change in the life of a person. I'm sure many of y'all are familiar with the parable of the sower. If you're not, I'd encourage you to read it. It's in Matthew 13. It's a parable that Jesus shares where a sower goes out to sow seed, and that seed represents the Word of God. The seed falls on many different types of soil, but the only soil that produced fruit and multiplied was the good soil. I read that passage for so many years and just focused on the different types of soil. But I read that passage last year and I suddenly saw it from a totally different perspective. I saw it from the standpoint of the sower. He was indiscriminate. He sowed that seed all over, on the path, on the rocky ground, amongst the thorns. 
and only a percentage of what he sowed took root. I was very convicted as I was reading from that perspective and preparing for this message today has convicted me all over again. Am I being choosy? Am I saving the work of sowing for those I deem might be good soil? Or am I being indiscriminate? Also, I think we can all agree that the soil of our own hearts hasn't always been good soil. And I'm so thankful that someone still sowed in me in the times when the soil of my own heart was hard and thorny. One of my favorite scriptures is Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This instruction is not just for pastors and church leadership. This is Christ's parting words to every single believer. How exciting is that? God takes his poor, struggling children, his children who have denied him, we have failed him in so many ways. And his last words before he ascends to the Father are, now it's your job to make disciples. And I love how he says, I am with you always to the end of the age. Debbie encourages us to look up the original Hebrew and Greek on blueletterbible.org. So I looked up this word with, that he is with us um, on that website. And it says that he is behind us, that he follows that us. That's the original Greek. And I love that. He knows how hard it's gonna be. He knows this is a difficult task that he's calling us to and that we are going to need him to accomplish this. He also knows there's gonna be a lot of times it feels like a waste. There have definitely been times in my life where despite my best efforts of trying to sow seeds, it has felt like a total waste. Our last life together, we learned about the devices of the devil. It was a really powerful message. I'd encourage y'all to go back and listen to if you missed it. But I think a big way the devil gets to us when it comes to evangelism and discipleship is discouragement. We feel like we are ill-equipped, we are ineffective, and what we're doing is a total waste of our time. But we have assurance. We can stay faithful to the Great Commission when we see zero fruit. First of all, because it's commanded, but also because he promises to never leave us or forsake us. We can continue to invest and hope and pray that we are sowing seeds that will reap a future harvest. God's word tells us in John 4 that one sows and another reaps. I love the beauty of the body of Christ as the Lord uses us working together for the saving of souls. Our former and pastor in Louisiana once shared a really helpful visual. He said that you can think of souls coming to Christ as a bucket Maybe at some point you'll get to see that bucket overflow and you'll get to be present when the Lord saves someone when they give their life to Christ and you get to be there. But make no mistake, every drop along the way in that bucket is powerful and needed in the life of that person. The Lord uses the work of every faithful servant along the way. I was so moved a few years ago when I heard Jenny Allen share her testimony. Jenny Allen hosts an annual women's conference you might be familiar with. She said that in college, she was so lonely. She just wanted friends so bad. She just didn't have anyone around her that she had really connected with. A young mom had invited her to coffee and she said, I didn't think she was cool. I didn't think that, you know, we were not close to the same age. I didn't think we had anything in common. And I had every reason to not go, but I really needed a friend and I was just so lonely. So she said, yes, that coffee date sparked a friendship that ultimately led to Jenny becoming a believer. It's a sweet friendship she maintains to this day. She told that packed arena, I am standing before you today because a believer invited me to coffee. How powerful is that? She then shared a statement that has stuck with me all these years. She said, the great commission is this, because you have been with Jesus, go be with people so they can be with Jesus. It really is that simple. Hearing that testimony made me realize that I was making it a lot harder than it needed to be. And I wasn't being faithful to Christ's parting words to me as a believer. 
Another scripture I've found really encouraging on this journey is Luke 12, 11 through 12. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. This passage is obviously speaking of dangerous times for believers, but it has application for many different circumstances. The Lord loves us so deeply. He desires to lovingly walk us through every situation in our lives. I have found so much peace in just asking the Lord how he would have me sow seeds. What would you have me do in this situation? In this situation? and just following through with whatever I feel the Holy Spirit is prompting me to do. And then just trusting God with the rest, not being burdened with what's gonna happen and did I do enough? He's got it. He knows that we are dust. He is more than capable of working through our frailties. We've already talked about how we can't cause anyone to come to Christ because we don't have that power. And on the flip side, If the Holy Spirit is doing a work in someone's heart, something you say is not gonna blow the whole thing up. He is gonna work through that. He's gonna work despite our frailties and his will will be accomplished. I think one of the biggest fears that we have uh, when it comes to this sort of thing can be turned into one of the greatest things the Lord can use. I spent so many years worrying about someone asking me something I didn't know the answer to. And so I just, you know, kind of tried to avoid any situation where that might occur. But I've come to realize how much people value honesty and transparency. And when a believer says they don't know, it shows the world, we don't have all the answers. We just know who to take our questions to. It's a great time to show believers and non-believer friends what to do when things don't make sense. Those are awesome opportunities for the Holy Spirit to show up big when we feel like we're kind of a little bit over our head. So let's invite those hard questions. Let's invite our friends along with us on that journey. We can encourage them to pray with us. We can look up scriptures together. We can reach out to church leaders We can look up articles and commentaries by trusted theologians. Let's invite them to experience that journey with us and and just be honest. Hey, I I really have no idea. I don't know, but I would love to find out together. Do y'all know how disarming that can be for someone to hear? That's what the Christian life truly is all about. Taking our concerns to the Lord and seeking him in humility with the things we don't understand. What a great way for us to model that. I know the feeling of being ill-equipped is not unique to me. I'm sure many of us feel apprehensive about putting ourselves out there in this way. So I wanna share with you one word that really took a lot of fear away from me and kind of changed my perspective on this. Several years ago, one of my friends invited me to a study that she was hosting. And I was like, oh, girl, I'm so excited. You're teaching a study. And she was like, no, no, no. She stopped me in my tracks. No, I'm facilitating. That word gave her the opportunity and the courage to host something that she otherwise wouldn't have. It was just a discussion-based study where we just got together and discussed God's word. It was so rich. It was women from all different backgrounds, different churches, and I learned so much during that time. Know that you don't have to have the perfect study. You do not have to come up with all original material to practice discipleship. There are so many different ways to go about this. And I'm gonna share one really simple way with you in just a minute. But there's one last thing I wanna discuss that I think really holds us back when it comes to discipleship. I was listening to a podcast recently that I really connected with and the host was talking about how when we're young, we hang out so often with our friends. Your friend calls you and says, hey, I'm going to Target, you wanna go? And you're like, I don't have anything going on. Sure. I don't even know what we're looking at. We're just going to Target together. But as we get older, we we start to think that we don't have time for those things. We don't prioritize getting together with our friends and and little simple things like errands and, you know, grocery store runs. We don't do those things together with our friends anymore because we don't value the community in the same way. Pastor Michael recently shared a statistic. 
He said in 1990, the average faithful church member attended church 3.8 times a month. Fast forward to 2022, the average faithful church member attends church 1.2 times a month. That's tough. I have another sobering statistic for you. Survey data from 2019 showed that 58% of Americans felt like they didn't have anyone in their life who truly knew them well. Our world is increasingly lonely and we are spending less time in godly community than ever before. Not only have our time priorities shifted, the things we value have also shifted. We think that in order to host and have somebody in our home, we have to be the perfect hostess. We have to cook the perfect meal or snacks. Our house has to be you know, impeccably decorated and it better be perfectly clean or we're not gonna have anybody over. Why do we do that? Why do we put that pressure on ourselves? I'm speaking to myself here too, because I am so guilty of this. We need to remember what it was like to be young and free from those burdens and just enjoy that deeper level of community with our friends. Back to the podcast, the host suggested one simple phrase for discipling others, especially this next generation. Come with me. We don't have to have all our ducks in a row to practice discipleship. In fact, we don't have to formally lead or even facilitate anything. It can be as simple as just calling a friend up and saying, hey, I'm thinking about reading Ephesians. You wanna read it together? You can call and say, hey, let's, let's look up some scriptures on prayer together. I've been feeling convicted to have a more prayerful spirit and learn more about prayer. Do you wanna learn together? How simple is that? Just pursue Jesus and invite a sister to come along with you. I can guarantee you that whatever ladies you encourage to come on that journey with you will be so excited. Don't make the mistake of assuming that other people aren't lonely and looking for biblical community. I'd like to encourage y'all to pray about who the Lord would have you to reach out to. Maybe it's an unbeliever that you already have a relationship with, or maybe it's an unbeliever that kind of keeps coming to mind that maybe the Holy Spirit would have you form a new friendship with. Or maybe it's a, a godly friend that you would like to just get to know better and have a more intentional relationship with. I think the first step to practicing biblical discipleship is seeking the Lord on what does that mean for me? Who should I invest in? How can you use my spiritual gifts for your glory? What have you taught me that I can encourage others with? It's really amazing to see how the Lord answers those prayers and it gives you so much peace and confidence with just stepping out in faith. I mentioned earlier that I would share one practical way that you can practice discipleship. Um, It's called a HEAR journal, H-E-A-R. I did not come up with this method. I have been a part of a discipleship group that used it for a year. We study through the entire Bible over the course of a year using this method. Um, You can use it for small group Bible study. You could use it one-on-one or even just for your own personal study. It's very flexible. You can adapt it to any any way you want to study. And literally anyone can do it. All you need is a notebook. So um, let me break down the letters for you. At the top of your page, you're gonna write whatever passage you're studying. And underneath that, you're gonna write an H. And uh, that stands for highlight. So you're gonna write out whatever is most meaningful, whatever is most convicting, awe-inspiring, just whatever it is that really stands out to you. You're gonna write out that passage. The E is explain. I'm really passionate about this one. We need to know a little background on what we're reading so that we can properly interpret it. We want to know who the author is. Who is he speaking to? Why is he he writing to them? What sort of literature is this? What sort of letter is it? It's really imperative that we know those things because we know that God's word does not mean something for us today that it did not mean to the original audience. We don't want to read with our 2023 20, eyes, looking for ourself in the passage. We want to read with an eternal perspective. And we, we want to be looking for the Lord in the passage. So the E is where we're going to kind of list out some of those context things that are going to help us interpret what we're reading. The A is apply. I think that one is fairly self-explanatory. We all feel the Spirit's conviction and know how we can put what we're reading into practice to, to honor the Lord more with our lives. 
The R is reflection. And that one is going to be just between you and God. Maybe it's a prayer of worship, a prayer of awe, a confession. Maybe it's asking the Lord to sanctify you and change you. It's a prayer based on what you learned that day. Using this method, you can get together weekly with several ladies and just discuss your journals. Just chat about what you wrote. Um, It's really amazing to just sit back and see how the Lord spoke to each member of the group. Most weeks, each of us had highlighted different passages, but even those times when we all highlighted the same passage, we would have different observations and convictions about the passage. God's word never returns void. And it's really cool to see how his word speaks so personally to each of us. Psychologists say that human joy isn't fully experienced until we share it with others. That's why we talk about the things that are important to us because we experience additional joy when we share it with others. I found there's nothing in my life where that's truer than the relationship that, sharing the joy that I have in my relationship with the Lord. And it never gets old, seeing how the Holy Spirit speaks into the lives of my friends. Well, ladies, I hope that something I have shared today has encouraged your hearts. I just wanna remind y'all that we are all capable of and called to discipleship. Your story is important. It's valuable to your sisters. This is the sort of rich community that the Lord created us for. I wanna leave y'all with something my sweet friend Heather told me last week. She said uh, a quote that you may have heard before. I had never heard it and I love it. I'm just a beggar showing another beggar where to find bread. And sweet Heather, she said, I always like to add, if I run a little faster than someone else, it's only because I'm so hungry and I know how satisfying the Lord is. I love that perspective. Grab onto someone ahead of you and pull along someone behind you. Disciples making disciples. That's how the Lord intends us to walk this journey. Let me close this in prayer. Lord, it just still blows my mind that you use your children for building, making disciples, that you entrust us with that. Lord, it is such an honor to, sh- to serve you in that way. I pray that you'll help us to take this calling seriously. I pray for boldness, Lord. I pray that you will guide us in every step of the way. I thank you for every woman here today. I pray, Lord, that we will glorify you in all we do. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Thank you, Julia, for encouraging us. Mm -hmm. Yes, I love that they clap for us. Thank you for that encouraging and just a perspective shift in really the, the small difference that it would make to have a conversation, to open up a conversation and to sow those seeds in different places and to find something in common, that common ground. I've, I've made a new friend in my neighborhood and it's really by starting, I commented on her flowers as she has such pretty flowers. And we've started a conversation through that because I love those as well. And so that has continued to be now noticing how the Lord just brought me into her life with um, some challenges that she's having with her son that I have had with mine. And so um, interesting, just an interesting perspective. Thank you so much for opening up your life and your heart and sharing that with us today. I appreciate y'all being here today. We're going to close with um, a a a t-shirt party, I think is what this is called. If you have offered to help and stay after life together, we do a lot of things together. We, we study together, we pray together, we eat together, we laugh together. Sometimes we fold t-shirts together. So uh, if you can help us or volunteer earlier to stay behind, we're going to be folding, I don't know, about 600 t-shirts for preparation for Cultivate. And again, that's one of the good things that you can do and just start a conversation. So our challenge today has been, I love those, I'm going to make those two words come with you know will you come with will you join me in this would you come with um whether that's just to a a a restaurant come with coffee take a flower from your garden to a neighbor just ask the lord for those start paying attention to those opportunities I'll never forget years ago after Facebook came out and that was the big social craze and everybody connecting on Facebook. And listen, I loved connecting back with my Shreveport friends. I mean, we didn't cross paths other than online. And I'll never forget the day I had gotten a a banner or something from Facebook that says, you have 3,000 friends. And so I'm telling my husband that morning, oh, I got 3,000. 
thousand friends, you know, on Facebook. And then that evening I come home from work and some, we had had a major thing happen and I am at the kitchen table and I'm just crying and I'm saying, I have no friends. I'm telling him, seriously, I have no friends. He's like, can one of those 3,000 people help you? You know, I mean, surely one of those. And I realized those are all, you know, they're all, it's not the same. It's just not the same. Online is not the same as in my life. And I now have realized over these last years, I have missed that terribly. And it's time to get back to that. So this is a good opportunity, life together, to do that. So you're welcome to stay and visit. Or if you've got some friends meeting meeting for lunch downstairs, you're welcome to do that. But if you're going to stay and help us with T-shirts, I think we're going to do that to that part. So stay and enjoy your friendships together. I appreciate you being here.